Good evening, everyone. Kalispera says. Let us begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Uh, welcome, everyone, no matter where you are, wrapped around a blanket in wintry Melbourne or on a deck chair in sunny Greece. These live online seminars can be followed from anywhere in the world from Facebook or YouTube links. With most seminars, whether they're online or at the mezzanine, we do try and make the recordings available uh, within a few days. A reminder of next week's seminar, which will be a physical seminar delivered uh, at the mezzanine level of the Greek Centre, is by Monash University's Dr. Kostadina Dunis on literary translation as a political act, transferring post-war narratives from the margins to the mainstream. But let's return to tonight's topic by uh, Alex Bilinis on the role of Greek cotton merchants in the American Civil War. When I first started interacting with uh, Alex a few years ago on social media, he commented to me, Nick, what have you got against us North Americans? We don't appear anywhere in the seminar series. My reply was, because I feel sorry for you and I don't want you waking up at such ungodly hours. Uh, it was 4 a.m. for Alex today, 1 a.m. for our speakers in Vancouver and San Francisco during the last, the last few weeks. Uh, Alex replied, give us a time slot and we'll be there. And today um, will be his second presentation in this series. This just goes to show his passion and determination uh, that he has as a researcher and who is sort of super keen to share his insights and research with a wider audience. And we're very grateful um, for that. Um, he's also speaking on a topic, cotton, which is very close to my heart for two reasons. Um, firstly, the role um, Egyptian cotton and Greek entrepreneurs, uh, so the, the topic Egyptian cotton and Greek entrepreneurs is a topic that I've researched and have presented in the past, and it also does form part of Alex's narrative today. And secondly, hailing from Karadzitsa, a less developed part of Central Greece, which excels only in two areas, making super cultivating cotton. We all have to be good at something. Um, if oil was the commodity that dominated um, the 20th century, cotton was certainly the commodity of the 19th century, the commodity that drove the Industrial Revolution. One could argue that cotton enabled the U.S. Civil War. When the southern states seceded from the United States to form the Confederate States of America in 1861, they used cotton to provide revenue for its government, arm, arms for its military, and economic power for diplomatic strategy for the fledgling Confederate nation. Cotton, along with slavery, made the feasibility of secession economically viable in the minds of decision makers in the Confederate States. By 1860, on the eve of the American Civil War, cotton accounted for almost 60% of American exports, representing a total value of $200 million a year, which is almost $10 billion in today's terms. Greeks were significant actors in the cotton trade. As global merchants, as growers, especially in Ottoman Egypt, did their role and activities influence developments and the final outcome of this US Civil War? This is the focus of tonight's presentation. A few things about our, our speaker today, Alex Bilinis. He hails from Salt Lake City in Utah, uh, but with origins from the beautiful island of uh, Hydra, but presently lives in South Carolina, where he teaches political science at Clemson University and will soon be commencing a PhD in digital history. He's a regular contributor to Neos Cosmos, writing on subjects pertaining to the Greek merchant marine, Greek diaspora, the Balkans, and Byzantium. Um, he's had quite a diverse career experience, having worked as an attorney, international banker, and journalist across a host of countries like US, UK, Hungary, Bulgaria, Serbia, Chile. So he's got um, um, quite a um, significant sort of um, professional background. Um, enough for me. I'll pass on the baton um, to Alex. Alex, um, take it away. Well, good morning <clears throat> to South Carolina and good evening <clears throat> to uh, my friends in the Antipodes and to those in the middle of the, t uh, the two um, time zones in Greece. It's uh, obviously a great pleasure once again to be uh, speaking to uh, friends in Australia about various subjects which unite the Greek diaspora. Uh, Nick and I, along with uh, other Greek Australians, uh, particularly um, folks at Neos Cosmos, and I wanna give a shout out to Neos Cosmos because uh, I've always been, um, you know, for 
over a decade, I have been working with them and corresponding with them. I think it's very important that the two largest Anglophone diasporas talk to each other, talk about our histories, our issues, uh, our American stories, our Australian stories, and our common Greek stories. So as always, it's a pleasure to be involved with um, our Australian brethren, and um, I'm very excited to talk about the uh, the subject in question, which I think is um, a subtext to uh, the global economy story, to the central drama of the American experience, the American Civil War, the ongoing struggle with dealing with the subject of, of, of enslavement and also an acknowledgement of the role that the slave economy had in fueling the Industrial Revolution, not only in our own country, the United States, but certainly in Western Europe. And what I think is important for us to know as Greeks is that Greeks were playing a role that's beneath the headlines. And I've always been fascinated as a researcher on those who are beneath the headlines, particularly when it happens to be my own ethnicity being involved in this. So just as a quick introduction, uh, I'm going to explain why I use the term King Cotton and then Greek princes of King Cotton uh, is, uh, you know, one of the ways I've expressed this subject in various lectures, but it, it is very much the role of Greek cotton merchants in the American Civil War. Uh, what you see here is a picture from 1900 of the New Orleans Church, which was the first Greek Orthodox Church, uh, the first Orthodox Church in the United States, uh, and it hails from the um, 1860s. So right after the guns uh, fell silent on the American Civil War. The reason I mention it is because the American story is a lot older than you think. So um, I think it's very important that, we, uh, that we're aware of this, uh, of this fact here. I'm just seeing how to switch the, uh, the sorry, the, oh, there we go. Perfect. So um, there was a key ethnic component to uh, the cotton trade. And that didn't only include Greeks, but Greeks were among the, eth the, the ethnic diasporas that played a role in the cotton trade. And Greek merchant and shipping families collaborated uh, to play this role in the cotton trade. So Cotton merchants were throughout uh, the Greek diaspora and New Orleans, because it was a key uh, trading hub in the United States, obviously was going to attract the attention of uh, Greek merchants and be then became the first uh, Orthodox Christian community in Greece. So if we go to the next slide. I think it makes sense first to talk about this Greek diaspora circa 1850. So right at the heart uh, and at the height of the Greek cotton trade globally. So where were we just to get kind of a global uh, perspective in 1850? Well, as most of us uh, know from our chronology and history, there is a small, impoverished, independent Greece. It's basically Peloponnesus, uh, what we would call Steria Elada from the Arta Lamia line, and certain islands of the Aegean, the, uh, the Kiklades, and certainly islands like mine that played uh, Hydra, that played a particular role in the Greek Revolution. But Greece is small, Greece is utterly impoverished. And the real power in the Greek world remains either in the Ottoman Empire, along with the bulk of the population, or in major communities such as Odessa in the Russian Empire, 
Trieste, and this is a picture of Trieste in the Austrian Empire, Marseille in France, uh, Liverpool in the UK, and absolutely crucially to our discussion and to the cotton story, Alexandria in Egypt, which is a basically self-governing uh, pashaluk of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Greek merchant fleet in the 1850s was not quite the behemoth uh, that it is today, but it is very large and it's flying multiple flags. Oftentimes we think of the multiple flags as an Onassis phenomenon. Well, Greeks had been doing that for years, arbitraging flags, whether it be in the Ottoman Empire during the pre-revolutionary era, Greeks, particularly from Hydra and Spetses and Psara, would fly the Russian Empire. Uh, at this time, the Ionian Islands, which are major uh, hubs of shipping, are under Britain, so they can fly the Union Jack. So Greeks were very good at arbitraging flags. Greek ships have always furthermore focused on bulk cargoes and commodities. So cotton made perfect sense. It was a bulk shipment product, which has always been and remains a Greek specialty. And as, as uh, my friend and colleague Nick uh, pointed out very well, the Greek homelands have major cotton production. So certainly uh, Karditsa, Thessaly in general, but also if we count uh, the Asia Minor hinterland around Serbia, there are may, excuse me, around Smyrna, there are major cotton production uh, then and now. So Greeks had an understanding of cotton, a specialization in cotton, and Greek shipping was also well poised to be involved in, uh, in the cotton trade. So I bring that up just to say that there was a network, there was a specialty, and not only were Greeks involved in the merchant process, uh, they were also heavily involved in the transportation. So let's talk a little bit more uh, about the merchants. Um, they were family, kin, and island-based. We could almost change the name of this discussion to the Hios merchants, because as a practical matter, the cotton trade was dominated by Hiot families. And this included the Raleigh family, Rodokanaiki, Benaiki, Frangiadi, Petrokokino families that played that were often intermarried. They were not only intermarried amongst each other in terms of the um, of their uh, you know merchant activities. They also were increasingly intermarried with merchant marine families. Uh, of course, they were proud ethnic Greeks, uh, often quite declaratively Orthodox Christian, but they were very comfortable with multiple nationalities passports, and locations in major economic hubs. And as I've said before, these included key uh, places in the Austrian, French, British, Ottoman, Russian empires. And increasingly, as the 1800s progressed, they crossed the Atlantic to the New World, to this great American Republic, which is pulsing with economic activity. To the degree possible, their operations were also vertically integrated. So they would be on both the buy and the sell side. And where possible, they were involved in downstream production. Again, where possible, they also uh, had Greeks, sometimes from the same families, involved in the merchant marine part of the process. So who's this picture? This is Nicholas Benaiki uh, from New Orleans, born in Hios, who was the Greek consul, a merchant uh, in cotton and other bulk commodities, and the founder of the Holy Trinity Church in 1864, which again is far earlier than the Greek story 
I mean, the American story of most Greek Americans. So I think it makes sense to talk about Greek America or Greeks in America up to 1850. Um, from my recent trip to Hydra in May, I got confirmation from the Hydra archives that ships were regularly visiting the Americas at the turn of the 19th century. So while it wasn't uh, a port of call, you know, these weren't ports of call with the same uh, consistency as Mediterranean and Black Sea ports, Hydra's commerce did begin to reach uh, the Americas. Many of you will be familiar with the new Smyrna colony from the 18, uh, 1760s, which again was the first large scale Greek settlement in the United States or what would become the United States at that time. It was British controlled Florida. Those descendants were largely dispersed after the failure of the colony and assimilated into Spanish or British Florida. So they didn't play a role either in the global economy or really in the Greek American story. Uh, Americans were galvanized by the Greek War of Independence. Many Americans such as Samuel Gridley Howe, George Jarvis, James Williams, uh, a descendant of George Washington, uh, among, again, hundreds of others actually went to Greece. Many of them gave their lives, including um, a formerly enslaved person called James Williams. So there was a great deal of interest uh, by Americans in Greece. It was really uh, commercial interest, particularly tobacco and opium, that kept America from more actively recognizing the Greek uh, revolutionaries. But in terms of public opinion, it was a cause celebre. And many Greek war refugees and orphans came to the United States after the Greek Revolution. So you had a small community because of that. But for the purposes of our discussion, it was really from the late 1840s that merchants, particularly kiosk houses, started to ensconce themselves in New York, which for all practical purposes was the brokerage center of the South and the financial center of the United States. Other East Coast cities like Boston, and then slowly down the coast into the, the major cotton ports. Uh, that would include Charleston in South Carolina, Savannah in Georgia, Mobile in Alabama, and of course, New Orleans. Uh, again, following my inevitable uh, return to Hydra, I have a picture of um, Alexander Dimitri, um, American-born New Orleans educator and diplomat of Athenian, Hydriot, and French Native American descent in the 1840s. So even before the Greek community was established in New Orleans, you did have a small presence uh, of Greeks in New Orleans. So I think uh, whenever possible, I, I like to resort to the map to give us a perspective of just how important New Orleans was. So this uh, picture, courtesy of Wikimedia Commons, shows you the drainage of the Mississippi River in the American continent. Um, and I think we could call it a continent, uh, just as uh, you Australians call your vast island a continent, well, the United States is also of continental size and scale. Let's also remember that in the 1840s, the railway had not become ubiquitous. So rivers were the main highways. So you have in dark blue, the Mississippi River, but in light blue, you have 
the major tributaries such as the Missouri River, which goes all the way to Montana, the Arkansas, the Red, the Tennessee, Illinois, and Ohio rivers. All of these rivers for one degree to another are navigable, particularly the Ohio, the Missouri, and the Tennessee River. So you have the entire commerce of a continent emptying in to New Orleans. At this same time, the cotton economy is moving from the Atlantic coast of the United States, particularly South Carolina, parts of North Carolina, Georgia, into Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Texas, all these areas are the new lands of the cotton economy and are fueling an absolute boom in uh, cotton production and cotton exports, which is causing an industrial revolution in the northern states, which are uh, processing the cotton into textiles, and of course, exports primarily to Britain, but also France, Germany, the Netherlands. This is the real engine of the American economy fueled by the forced and horrific labor of enslaved peoples. And New Orleans is the key to all of this. And as a merchant people with an eye for business, it makes perfect sense that the Greeks were going to ensconce themselves in New Orleans. So, as I referred to, uh, the Greek merchants could not escape the importance of the American economy. And while New York remained a key hub for the Greek merchant families, New Orleans in the 1850s was where the bulk of the Greeks went because of its key merchant role in the United States. Uh, and let's be clear, it was a different type of Greek presence in the United States than my uh, you know, parents and grandparents who came here. Their business in America was business. And here I'm using, uh, I'm paraphrasing a quote by an American president, Calvin Coolidge, who said that is the main function of America is business. Well, their business in America was business. It was not the mass immigration narrative that is normative in America amongst Southern Europeans like Greeks, Italians, other Balkan peoples, Eastern Europeans who came en masse at the uh, end of the 19th century, early 20th century. So as opposed to the often penniless uh, immigrants of the 19th, you know, late 19th, early 20th century, what did the typical merchant look like? Well, the typical merchant was usually a scion or relative of a merchant house with global operations. So they were wealthy, they were multilingual, they were well-educated, if not university educated, which often they were, they were certainly educated in the school of life, uh, the school of business, the school of the merchant marine. So these were uh, highly cosmopolitan business people and technocrats. Now, they didn't have a large presence in New Orleans. You know, it was, we're talking about three or four hundred um, people, and not all of them were these uh, scions. You also had, as always, sailors to uh, who, to use the um, Greek American term, and I'm sure they use it in Greek Australia, jumped ship and decided to stay to small business people, to laborers. But still, the engine of this community and the leadership of this community were the merchants. But they were market takers in New Orleans, not market makers. But as my colleague uh, 
Nick alluded to, there was Alexandria. And in Alexandria, they were market makers. Greeks formed the largest European population. From, nine, from, excuse me, from 1839, Greeks control one third of the cotton trade. And whereas the Greek merchant fleet at in the 1800s, mid 1800s, periodically called at American ports, in the Mediterranean and Black Seas, the Greek merchant fleet was ubiquitous. It was in all the ports and there were Greek merchants in all the ports. So you had a real opportunity for a completely Greek integrated operation in the cotton trade. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, obviously buying on the buy side in Alexandria, on the sell side, let's say in Marseille, Le Havre or Liverpool, They'd be on the sell side. They'd be on the transportation in Greek merchant ships, but also Greeks would be involved in the financing, the product uh, production, in many cases, the ownership, the factoring of the product, uh, the brokerage, all areas of the operation in Alexandria would be controlled by various Greek houses. We, who had their own branches in the United States. So these networks spread the latest intelligence about conditions in the pre-Civil War U.S., which we need to remember was by far the largest and most efficient cotton producer. And part of the reason it was efficient is because of the cruelty of the uh, slave system, but also because it was the best financed in the world and they were using the latest technology for ginning. And all of this information was readily known to the Greek merchants who were also small players in the American cotton uh, trade. They also, and I suggest this was absolutely vital, had a good understanding of where things were going in the United States, that the secession uh, movement was gaining steam in the late 1850s and then came to a head with the election of President Lincoln in 1860. The South was going to leave and cotton was key to the uh, Southern secession uh, strategy. There was therefore going to be an issue with cotton supplies and an opportunity for the Greeks via Egyptian cotton primarily, but also cotton in the Ottoman Empire. And while I neglected to mention this because it's more of a, uh, of a side player, also India played a major role in filling the gap in cotton supplies, and Greeks were there too. But it, for the purpose of our discussion and the Greek role, it was Egyptian cotton that made a major difference. Production more than tripled in the Civil War era, which eased cotton supply issues, which were thought by Confederate diplomats to be the ace that they held in diplomacy in terms of Anglo-French intervention. Now, I don't want to suggest at any point here that the Greeks were trying to defeat the South, that the Greeks were against the slave economy. Okay, that is a bridge way too far. And we know that Greeks did hold slaves in New Orleans and elsewhere in the South. So Greeks were involved in the slave economy. There were Greeks in the North who were abolitionists, but there were also Greeks in the South who were enslavers. I wanna make that point that we don't confuse the discussion. They, the Greeks looked at this as a business opportunity 
filling a need because of politics and the potential uh, for a blockade, there was an opportunity to use Egyptian and, and Ottoman cotton as an alternative supply. Okay. Just to give you an idea of what the contemporaries were saying about these merchants. Now, this is a little bit after the Civil War, but it gives you an idea of just how important these merchants were. So from the New Orleans Times Picayune, the Greeks' large capital, their harmony of action, and their close connection with strong Greek firms in the leading commercial cities in the world made them respected by their boldest off operators. Their secrecy, an air of mystery, a coolness of nerve, a boldness, and a sagacity which that astonished the business world. <clears throat> From the New York uh, Commercial and Financial Chronicle, the influence of the Greeks at New York and Liverpool in the markets for cotton, grain, and other produce is so great and constant that a few words about their country and themselves may not be out of place. They furnish some of the most daring sailors of the Mediterranean. The growth of the merchant marine has been rapid and astonishing. Greek merchant houses abound in nearly all the Mediterranean ports, but also Liverpool, London, the French Atlantic ports, Bombay, Calcutta, Rio, our U.S. ports, our, excuse me, our southern ports, and we have some eight to ten in New York. I always find this interesting. They are apparently not jealous of each other. That's, uh, I guess things have changed in the course of 100, 150 years, but combine constantly for united action. And by means of branch houses, they pay as few commissions as possible. Their transactions are paid on joint account. We have an explanation of why Greeks can ship cotton and grain where we cannot. As regards cotton, it is through them that a very large portion of our shipments are made and hence their importance to the trade. They are frequently better and more promptly informed than many others by the reason of their free and full intercommunication among each other. So contemporaries, both in New Orleans and in New York, were able to explain the why. Why were the Greeks so successful? So let's go back quickly to New Orleans, uh, one of my favorite cities, one of the most amazing cities in the United States. I try to get there a couple times um, yeah. a year. Um, the Civil War caused an exodus of Greek merchants. And often these merchants, you'd find them in pictures in New Orleans and then in pictures in Alexandria. So we know that so many of the Greek merchants went directly to Alexandria, took their capital, took their expertise, took their gins, and moved to Alexandria. Others did remain in New Orleans, and many fought for the Confederacy. Uh, the first Orthodox Church was built there in 1866. Like lots of uh, initial Orthodox churches in the diaspora, for example, in Trieste or in Marseille or elsewhere, the church was Greek, but multi-ethnic. You had Serbs, Syrians, Bulgarians, and Russians. And often enough, if you look at the census records, which I've looked uh, in quite a bit of detail, these Greeks will be listed as citizens of Britain or Austria, the Ottoman Empire or Russia. So this community was fundamentally different from the Greek American narrative of penniless mass immigration. I know that's not the main subject here, but I think it is interesting to show that the first major community in the United States of Greeks was founded as part of this Greek merchant hub, which has spread around the world. Because most of us in Australia and the US and Canada, we think of Greek immigration as solely a mass immigration 
based mainly uh, in the need to improve our economics. Well, there's another story of merchants going all over the world because of economic activity and because they had the capital to be involved. So. so why is this significant? Well, for a couple of reasons. The strategy of the American Civil War on the part of the South was that the British and the French needed American cotton, Southern cotton, in order to keep their industries going. In fact, the term King Cotton was from a South Carolina senator that said no sane nation will make war on cotton because cotton is king. They expected that there would be Anglo-French intervention a recognition of the Confederacy and forcing the uh, Northern Navy to lift the blockade. That was the strategy of the South. The idea was use the South's military tradition to blunt a Northern invasion and wait for the pain of the cotton famine to bring the British and the French into the war. That didn't happen. There were alternative supplies. The North, in spite of its early defeats, managed to prevail on the battlefield. But the real place that the Civil War was won and lost was in the realm of fin finance. The Confederates expected cotton to be the draw that would bring in European money and European intervention, and it didn't happen. So can we say that this small cadre of merchants changed history? Probably not. But at the same time that it was part of a larger series of forces arrayed against the cotton economy, I think that that's a fair statement. And I also think it's important as we become more mature as a Greek American community, that we start looking at the role of this merchant community in founding Greek America. But also I think it's interesting that we understand more about this diaspora merchant community, which played a major role in the emergence of the Greek state and lest we forget, whenever Greece required us, the diaspora was always there to call. There was a major merchant in Egypt who, as part of his um, will, bequeathed the sum, which eventually was used to buy the most modern ship in the Greek Navy. That was the Averov, Captain by a fellow from Hydra. Well, actually, to be to be honest, he was both Hydriot. Uh, he was Hydriot on his father's side and Hyot on his mother's side. And that ship financed by merchants, primarily by merchants abroad, helped to destroy the Turkish Navy and make the First and Second Balkan Wars a foregone conclusion in favor of Greece and her allies. So these merchant communities were significant to Greece, but they were also significant to the economy, uh, to the global economy and to history. So did they? It's a possibility. The I'll leave you with a cartoon from the London magazine Punch. You can't see all of it, but um, the, the uh, tall gentleman in the top hat is the British Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston. And the fellow to his right, if you're looking at it, is Jefferson Davis, the Confederate pre uh, president. Now, what you don't see is the other British fellow said, well, that was Jeff Davis, Pam, uh, for Lord Palmerston. Don't you recognize him? 
He says, hmm, not exactly, may have to one of these days. Well, uh, luckily, it didn't happen. And the open question remains, why didn't it happen? And one of the tantalizing questions is the role of the Greek cotton merchants. So thank you. Uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, very much as always enjoyed the opportunity to speak about this. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Alex. That was um, quite a sort of um, fascinating sort of presentation. I might sort of just quick start the questioning. Um, it would have been good to see a, a table of the course of the Civil War and the annual decline of cotton in the southern states compared to the rise of cotton production uh, in Egypt and the production of cotton in Egypt to what extent did it supplant, was it able to sort of fill the market void, like 20%, 50%? I don't know if you've sort of looked at those figures because I know um, it probably quintupled or something like that and the prices as well. So it'd be good to see some type of comparison to what extent was the Egyptian market. Sure, there were other sources as well, India and so forth. To what extent was the rise in cotton production, mainly by sort of um, Greek farmers, um, how much was it able to supplant the misproduction, the misproduction of the lower production from the southern states? Um, and just one thing I wanted to add, it's just not enough just to supplant like ton by ton. The quality has to be there as well. And what was very um, unique and also uh, unusual about the uh, Greek uh, merchants in Egypt is that over the, over the course of the century, they also developed their own varieties. And in the end, varieties that were quite competitive in quality to the uh, American varieties because American cotton was the best, you know what I mean? So, yeah. So I don't know if you've had a look at that sort of, done some type of statistical comparison, the tonnage produced, the decline in the southern states, and then the uplift in Egypt. To see, well, know. there's, what's interesting is we know that the Egyptian production went up about three and a half times in the course of the, uh, of the American Civil War. So that's one example. The decline of cotton is uh, from the south is interesting for a couple of reasons because the initial southern strategy was a cotton embargo to try to force their hand. The at the same time, cotton was a currency, so cotton was being smuggled out of the south via Mexico. So Mexico became a major cotton exporter, but it was often transshipping American cotton. So across the Texas-Mexico border, you had shipments out. So there were, uh, there were supplies going out. I don't have the, uh, the book in front of me, but one of the most interesting books about the slave economy called The Half Has Never Been Told refers to the availability of cotton in Liverpool in 1862. And the percentage had dropped almost to single digits from the pre-war stage. So you had an incredible drop in quantity. The only thing in that initial period of adjustment that saved the, um, the uh, production, you know, the uh, keep, kept production going in Britain is that 1859 and 1860s were bumper crops in the South, and it provided a degree of glut in terms of, uh, of cotton supplies. But in the meantime, you had a, you know, an, uh, an immediate growth of production in primarily in Egypt, but also Brazil, India, the Ottoman Empire. I mean, this is an ongoing research. So to your point, getting those tables is absolutely vital. Right now, I'm just making the connections. But the um, what I need to do and what I need to see is beyond Egypt, how did Ottoman Empire production increase? How did Brazilian, Indian uh, production increase? And then also try to get a real feel for the American figures because how much got out, uh, there was a lot of blockade running and typically guns would be traded for cotton in Liverpool. So guns would go out, 
our guns would go in, cotton would go out, luxuries would come in because obviously whenever you have scarcities, it's not just guns that you bring in, you bring in luxuries. That trade I've not looked at yet. So this is this is definitely a work in progress and I appreciate your point there. Yeah, and my gut feeling is that probably there were definitely the shortfall was never made up. There was always that gap because otherwise the price wouldn't have gone up four or five times. And that's where a lot of those Greek families really made some absolutely amazing fortunes and later on became benefactors as well. And, uh, yeah. and I also appreciate your point about uh, the different cotton varieties because it's not just that they, you know, the the Greek producers and the other producers were reaping benefits and not trying to improve uh, their varieties because they very much were. Uh, so they were responding not only to the market opportunity, but looking for a longer term investment because at some point the war was going to end and caught, you know, you would still have some version of American cotton that you'd have to compete against. Now, because the slave economy ended the costs of American production inevitably rose. I mean, whenever we talk about slavery being inefficient, while that's true, there were certain types of activities that could only occur at the price they were occurring via horrific coercion. And, and that was the cotton price of the antebellum South. Another example, relatively unknown the largest rice exporter in the world was my state south carolina prior to the the american civil war that production effect, uh, effectively ended once the slave economy ended because the coercion required for that kind of work at that you know to bring those kind of prices couldn't happen without you know, the horrific coercion was of slavery, not to say that the sharecropping system, uh, basically an ensurfment was that much better, but it still could not compete with uh, the low prices via slavery, which meant that Egyptian cotton would remain competitive because you were now competing post uh, civil war with American cotton based on some form of, of wage labor if that does that make sense yeah absolutely and egyptian labor would have been much cheaper but um, by all means here yeah. okay just some questions from the audience uh georgia sure. but this is uh thank you for this illuminating lecture was the hiot merchant benaki the same benaki museum benefactor i assume yes yes they yes. were they were part of the same family i don't know if they were brothers or cousins I believe that they, if nothing else, they were first cousins. Um, the Hewitt families were highly intermarried. I think that they were even marrying second or third cousins. I think they were just shy of the consanguinity uh, uh, mm -hmm. strictures of the Greek Orthodox Church. But these families were highly intermarried. And so the answer is yes, they were part of the same family. Question from um, Yanni Cartlidge. Uh, this was discussed a bit, but could you expand on the relations between the Greek merchant community in the US and the merchant community in the UK, especially the Hiots? Sure. Uh, the center of most of the um, Hiot operations by the 1850s had moved to the UK. So the Hiotis were involved in bulk trades uh, both cotton and also the grain trade. I mean, they had their hands. I mean, they 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 practiced the perfect portfolio strategy in that they did multiple bulk trades. So Chiotis controlled a lot of the trade coming out of the Black Sea into um, the Mediterranean and Britain. So from the Ukrainian steppes uh, into the markets of Europe and we we could think of london every bit is the the hub of this discussion and the united states is the spokes so a lot of the uh, merchants who arrived in places like new york or new orleans were coming via london or trieste because they were part of the same business so typically 
the Raleigh family or the Benaki family would send their employees, which were by and large relatives, into these um, into these locations. So it was the same family. It uh, was the same company, and they were basically taking orders from from London. So the relationship is that London or Liverpool is the hub and the US is the spoke. If that answers Yanni's uh, question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got a question from um, Costa. Is it right that cotton, at least after processing, was fundamental to modern war fighting at the time? Bandages, sails, uniforms. If so, other than production of raw cotton in the south, where was the process? Were the Greeks involved? Well, the Greeks' involvement in the south itself, they were basically buyers and shippers. Uh, they weren't involved in any, to, to my knowledge thus far, they weren't involved in any uh, further processing. They weren't involved in brokering and factoring in, um, in the United States. Now, in Egypt, I don't know whether they were doing any processing into bandages or anything else. But they were involved in the entire uh, brokerage finan uh, financing and production process. Uh, I think most of the uh, the milling textiles were basically outside of the uh, hands of Greek businesses. That's basically when it would be uh, sold to the the final user. The Greeks tended to prefer bulk production. Uh, in some ways, because it was easier, it was lower involvement, it was easier to ship, and you didn't have to invest in production facilities. Uh, now that again, that was a little different in in Egypt, where Greeks were involved in a lot of local factory production, but Greeks have tended to prefer uh, buying it, selling it, shipping it, and let somebody else uh, manufacture it. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay. What I'd also say is it points out that there's a lot of things we still don't know about this community in New Orleans. Every time I go, I learn more things. This community also fanned out up the Mississippi. So you had a small community in Memphis. You had a small community in St. Louis. You had the fourth consulate in the United States was in St. Louis, right or you know, right down the Mississippi. Another thing I haven't found out is what were the role of Greek pilots on the Mississippi? Because the Greeks controlled the Danubian trade. So basically from the Black Sea to Budapest, or at least to Belgrade, that river trade was controlled by Greeks. Now, why wouldn't Greeks be involved in the Mississippi, which I call America's Danube? There's more to be found out here. Yeah. Yes, I'm still at your early stages. And um, yeah, um, just might you ask you one more question, a bit sort of unrelated. Um, you're about to start a PhD soon on digital history. Can you elaborate on that, um, Alex, or what does that involve? Well, what's to say? Um, um, Given that I'm, you know, currently a uni lecturer and uh, working, um, you know, at the university, there's an opportunity to continue studies for free. So uh, it looked like an opportunity. Uh, it's not so much at 54 years of age that I'm planning on uh, a career um, as a tenured professor. More than anything, I think there's a lot of stories that are of interest to me both as a Greek and as an American, that if I don't have a PhD program to uh, provide the dif uh, discipline, you know, there's going to be something else. There's going to be, I don't know, a trip to Greece or family or other business interests, uh, the job, you know, walking the dog or something that's going to take over from, from this. So I need the, uh, the discipline. It also will help me to uh, have more than just sentiment or wanting to eat great food, which will take me to New Orleans or mm -hmm. going to Greece. Not only will I be able to 
see relatives and enjoy the incredible food and you know the bosom of my homeland but it'll also be yet another reason to go because i have to go to museums and you know meet colleagues uh, who knows maybe it'll get me over to melbourne one of these days uh, <laughs> So it, it provides an excuse and a discipline, but definitely this, this, this uh, area of discussion is going to be my topic. <clears throat> the Greeks in the United States as part of a larger merchant story. I think it's, it's under the headlines. We know it happened. It doesn't take away from from the, uh, the great story of migrants to Australia or migrants to the United States and what, what our families did, but it, it's additive. It, it's not replacing, it's an additive Greek story. And I love telling Greek stories, particularly when they're also American stories. So hopefully that explains yeah. my okay. goals. And we might just finish up with one final question. Uh, do the descendants of these families still live in the USA? If so, have they assimilated into American culture or they still have ties with Greece? So I suppose, you know, do you have an inkling of the nature of the Greek community of New Orleans or? I do. Uh, it's it's my great pleasure. And I'm actually coming out with an article. Um, I'll, I'll probably have a version in Naos Cosmos, but I'm probably doing this in the United States. I actually uh, had the pleasure of meeting this uh, this lovely uh, lady um, who just retired from the New Orleans school system, who is a descendant of the first Greek in New Orleans. Uh, he, uh, I actually had a picture of uh, her ancestor, uh, Alexander Dimitri, on um, his grandfather was from Athens, his father was from Hydra, and this family was heavily involved in the New Orleans community, including the Greek community. They had assimilated into largely Catholic New Orleans, but this woman, um, Vicky Dimitri, returned to the Greek Orthodox Church basically as, as heritage. So they're probably the oldest identifiable Greek family in the United States. There are other members of the community there who have family from that period, but the, these merchants, because they were highly successful economically, uh, they tended after a generation or so to intermarry into the wider community. This occurred also in Europe. So there are descendants. Um, some of them have kept ties uh, with the Greek community, but because they're not part of what we would consider the normative Greek story, they're less involved. And that's another thing I want to do. I want to start piecing together names. Uh, I have a friend in uh, Greece who is from a Chios family who has tracked down a relative and has asked me to contact her. So there are, there are families, they're the last names. There's, you know, as genealogy becomes more interesting uh, to a lot of people, there's an opportunity to connect descendants with their Greek stories. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, Alex, um, thanks again. Um, apologies once again for waking up at this ungodly hour. Not at all. Ha hopefully next time you'll be in Greece and it'll be uh, much more respectable and um, and you'll need a support I can next to you instead of an espresso or coffee. Um, yeah. And uh, best of luck in your future research and I'm sure we'll have you, we'll have you back um, in the future at some stage. And um, I remind you all that next week's seminar with Kostadina Dunis is at the mezzanine level of the Greek Center. Thank you so much, Nick. And thank you uh, to everyone in uh, Australia or wherever you are for listening. It's a, it's a great honor to be talking about all this.